Welcome everyone. It's time we begin. Um, this is a public and formal um, session okay. during which the candidate Torbjörn Ott will defend his PhD dissertation. The title of the thesis is Mobile Phones in School from Disturbing Objects to Infrastructure for Learning. My name is Ulva Ward of Segerstad and I've been appointed faculty chair by the IT faculty and I'm also the examiner of the candidate. And uh, a public defense of a thesis for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy follows a certain procedure and uh, there are a number of participants who have certain roles in this procedure. Uh, but before we begin I'd like you all to, re to uh, remind you um, to switch off your mobile phones. <laughs> there might still be one or two with the sound on. <laughs> I'd also like to make you aware that the, we are streaming this event on YouTube and making it available for others, and that the discussion that takes place here will be publicly available on YouTube. Um, with this said, I'll introduce the participants and uh, also the sequences in this procedure. And the participants are the following. First, we have the candidate, Torbjörn Ott, who is the author of the work that will be discussed today. And uh, as faculty opponent, we're honored to have Professor Agnes Rokulska home uh, from the um, Open University in Milton Keynes in the UK. And uh, you're a professor of learning technology and communication at the Institute of Educational Technology at the University. And uh, Agnes is a prominent research in the field of mobile communication or mobile, mobile learning. And she's been working with these issues since 2001, leading research projects and on learning innovation both in the UK and internationally. And we also have a grading committee consisting of three members. And uh, these members are Professor Stefan Lastinski uh, at the School of Education and Communication in Engineering Science at KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Mm -hmm. I get it right? Thank you. <laughs> and we have uh, Associate Professor Jonas Landgren at the Department of Applied IT at the University of Gothenburg. And we also have uh, <laughs> Professor Merita Inge Wernersson at the University of West. <coughs> and present are also the candidate supervisors. And the main supervisor is uh, Associate Professor Alexander Wedemann. <laughs> <laughs> and the co-supervisors are uh, Associate Professor Johan Lundin and Professor Berne Lindström. Uh, and the procedure, the sequences in this procedure are the following. We begin with a candidate who will have an opportunity to um, make remarks on the work that will be um, discussed. And after this, the faculty opponent summarizes the thesis. <coughs> and this takes about 30, 45 minutes. Uh, and after which the ca uh, candidate may comment on the uh, summary. And this will be followed by a discussion between the opponent and the candidate. And uh, during this discussion, the opponent will critically scrutinize the work and ask the candidate questions. And this is the main part of the session. And uh, it takes about 40, 80 minutes, but there's no upper limit to this and uh, they will use the time that they need for this. After this discussion, each of the members in the grading committee will ask the candidate questions. And uh, when the grading committee's questioning is complete, I will invite questions from the audience. And uh, you can ask questions to the candidate in Swedish, if you like. Um, and after this, the public defence session will be closed and the grading committee will withdraw to discuss its decisions and uh, this takes about 30 minutes an hour and uh, during this time 
you will be invited to wait together with the candidate in the staff area uh, downstairs on floor three. And when the grading committees reached a decision, they were announced <coughs> publicly to the candidate. But we will now begin the procedure by hearing the candidate um, remarks <coughs> on the, the work. So please, Turbjörn. Yes, thank you, Ilva. Um, yes, uh, going over my thesis, again reading it, uh, I noticed there is a uh, few typos in it, but uh, I don't think I have to address them here. And uh, there are also some corrections uh, that I have uh, uh, summed up in an errata list and distributed to the opponent and the grading committee. Thank you. Yes. I'll now give the floor to the faculty opponent to summarize the thesis. Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure to be here today and um, to be able to uh, discuss the, the work with you. Um, I enjoyed reading it. Uh, it's an important topic that's being addressed here. Uh, a topic that's of interest to researchers, but also to the general public, I think. The way that mobile phones are used in schools impacts on so many people in society. So it's a, it's a fascinating topic, and uh, I was interested also to learn more about Sweden and how uh, schools uh, approach this subject, and the ways in which um, the teachers and the students <coughs> that you uh, were in touch with um, talk about their experiences. So thank you for doing all this work <laughs> for our benefit and I certainly enjoyed reading about it. So I'm going to present uh, the work um, based on, the, on my reading of the thesis, uh, trying to summarize the various aspects and the, the, the studies that were conducted and the, um, the theoretical approaches that you took, some of the findings um, I've pulled out some of the findings that I found interesting or salient, but there may be others that you uh, would like to bring to the fore later when you uh, get the opportunity. <coughs> Certainly there was a lot to be, to be learned uh, on this topic. So I begin um, with an overview of what this work was all about, uh, in case you haven't read the thesis or I don't remember the main points. So um, the first consideration is uh, to think about what is, what is school, because this research touches on uh, the way that technologies are used for learning in schools. So what is school? And Torbjörn um, begins by uh, defining school and considering it as a social practice. And this is something that uh, informs the rest of the work. So uh, he says that it's a social practice based around an infrastructure for learning, and that's going to be a key concept that's going to be used throughout the, the work in the thesis. So this infrastructure for learning are the resources, the human and the material resources and the arrangements uh, that are made for learning, and that includes the use of technologies, it's con the consideration of technology in that broader picture. What is the problem area that uh, Torbjörn is interested in? Well, it's the idea that um, this uh, infrastructure is being affected or perturbed by the uh, introduction of mobile phones that are brought into schools by the students. And these, this phenomenon um, has stirred up certain conflicts and tensions. The reaction has been uh, to call for a ban on this, the ban on the use of uh, the mobile phones in schools. And so uh, the research explores the tensions um, that uh, this uh, has created in upper secondary school in particular. So that's the, 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 the specific focus, uh, the students in upper secondary school in Sweden. Uh, four empirical studies were undertaken to investigate these, these tensions and conflicts. Um, these, these studies cover how the, uh, the conflicts, the, the problems have been portrayed in the press over uh, a number of years. 
and also how these conflicts and these tensions have been experienced on the ground by the students and, and by teachers. And the studies have, presented, have produced um, many different kinds of results, which we will look at um, a little later. Uh, overall, the politicians, um, and we know about their views partly through the, um, as a representative in the press, so they've suggested banning phones from classrooms, and indeed they introduced some, some legislation as well. But many teachers in reality do not ban them. So um, what's the result of all that? It's that the students are confused. I think they, they, they struggle with this situation. They struggle with these confusing school practices where the, there are different conflicting messages. Ban mobile phones permit their use, where does that leave us? So, um, some conclusions are drawn from all this work, uh, and it's about the fact that the mobile phone challenges conventional school practices. Nonetheless, the reality is that the mobile phones have become part of the school's infrastructure for learning. So that's the de facto situation. They have become part of that structure, and they are they're changing that infrastructure. So that's broadly uh, the scope and the, the remit of the thesis. So I'm going to um, give you a little bit of an introduction um, to this whole this whole topic, as presented in the thesis. So the, um, the background is that there have been various initiatives to promote the use of digital technology in schools and they have typically involved distribution of technology to the students. Now these have typically <coughs> been tablets or laptops that have been distributed, not mobile phones. The students are the ones who bring the mobile phones to school, and this appears to be causing the difficulty. Uh, in the public debate, as uh, represented in uh, newspapers, uh, mobile phones are uh, largely given a bad press. Um, they're described as distracting and disturbing to the learning environment. There are uh, different voices, um, so some people in favour, others against, and uh, ultimately some legislation was introduced, and this legislation can be invoked to ban the use of mobiles in class. But teachers are ambiguous or um, uh, divided in their reactions, they don't all want to use, uh, take advantage of this legislation, as I understand it. They don't necessarily want to use it. They are more or less permissive in their approach. All in all, what do the policymakers and the teachers and the students make make of it all? What do they make of it all? And that's the that's what uh, is being investigated. Of course, there would be different ways of, of investigating this whole area, and Torbjorn has made some sort of selection or some sort of plan about what he was going to look at and who he was going to talk to about this. And that's something that we're going to be considering, what he decided to do and, and how it was done. These are pictures that I've added in. They're not from, from the thesis. But just to, to pause for a moment um, and to think a little bit about the, the school environment <coughs> and uh, the use of technology there. Um, we've got two sort of contrasting pictures here. On the left is a classroom that looks quite um, well uh, ordered, I think, with the uh, use of uh, tablet computers there. The, the students look as if they're engaged in a structured tasks all working together um, under the control of the teacher perhaps or a well structured activity and then I think we can contrast this with the picture on the right which is um, a slightly different sort of scene here 
the students are maybe using their own devices, they're using phones, they look a little bit less um, coordinated, perhaps each is doing their own thing, we're not sure if they're working together, or if they're working separately, um, they are, perhaps are looking quite relaxed, they may be distracted and doing things that are completely unconnected to the task. So I thought these would be a nice nice images to bear in mind as we uh, kind of um, work our way through the work that was undertaken and, uh, and try to understand the, the disturbances and the, 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 the perturbation um, from the teacher's point of view, perhaps the policy makers, but then also uh, how the students uh, react to, to all this and what their views are. So we come to the aims and the research questions of the thesis. So any good thesis has uh, an <coughs> overall aim, and that is clearly specified. And here we know that the aim was to scrutinize, to critically scrutinize the mobile phone as a tool for learning in upper secondary school. So that the aim is, uh, is clearly stated. And then we have um, three research questions that enable the researcher to pursue the research, um, keep it on track, and ultimately to answer those questions, which then, uh, taken together, hopefully inform that, that aim and, and enable you, as, a, as an accomplished researcher, to be able to talk about that aim and the extent to which you fulfilled it, um, the, your original objective. And things can change along the way uh, in any research project. You can set out with some, some questions and then, and then perhaps other questions arise along the way and uh, you may pursue them either in the main project or in other further work that arises out of the thesis. So in this case, there were three research <coughs> questions. And um, the first one was... Uh, focusing on the public debate around mobile phones. So wanting to understand uh, what, what were the tensions that were being expressed uh, through this public debate or in this public debate. The second research question was all about uh, the teachers and the extent to which they give permission to, for students to use mobile phones during their lessons and the kinds of um, the kinds of uses that they, uh, they um, deem to be permissible. And thirdly, what do the students um, think? What do they think? What practices do they engage in? How do they perceive the mobile phone as a tool in school practice? So these are the three types of stakeholders that were um, addressed. Um, that, that were the, within the remit of this, um, of this investigation. So, um, mobile phones obviously are a relatively recent thing in the sense that uh, in the past, um, and mobile phones have been a long around a long time, but um, there wasn't the same saturation <coughs> we can see now uh, throughout society. Mobile phones were not being used for all aspects of, of life in the way that they are now. So the situation is um, different, but there's a history of ICT use um, throughout society and also in schools. And so there's a little bit of a background here about that history, and you can read the detail in the thesis, but this is just pulling out some uh, key, I suppose, um, uh, landmarks in, the, in that history, which some of you may remember um, if you've, if you've uh, been uh, sort of following that history uh, and you go back to the 1970s or 80s uh, and you can recall some of these things perhaps for yourselves. So um, there have certainly been a number of uh, initiatives uh, uh, reported in the thesis to provide ICT to Swedish schools, uh, ranging from early technologies such as film, radio and TV through to mobiles, uh, mobile uh, devices, as we said, tablets and, uh, and, and laptops nowadays. 
But school organization has remained more or less the same. And this would be true not just of Sweden, but also of many other countries, that, uh, that the systems don't uh, adapt easily, even though different uh, generations of technology are introduced. Sweden was one of the first to recognize the potential of digital technology in schools back in the 1970s. And um, in the 80s, it was all about the computers. It was all about learning how to use computers. And the word processor was the thing that people were, were um, concerned about. You know, what effect word processing was going to, be, um, was going to have on, on, on education, people's ability to, to write and, and so on. Um, and then through to the 1990s with the recession and a, a greater focus on streamlining uh, education, um, getting more value out of it, more value for money. As teachers being provided with PCs, um, perhaps being um, enabled to, to borrow the technology, buy it cheaply, so kind of the focus on technology there, but um, enabling people to get to know it. And um, discussion around the transformation of school practice. So if technology is having an effect on school practice, how do we know it's having an effect? And um, what, what should be measured? What could be measured? How do we know? How much time is needed to see change? Is a week enough? Is two weeks enough? Do we need two years, two decades? How do we know? And when do we know? And the third question here, um, and this maybe goes beyond the thesis, but these are sort of um, more general questions that are being asked and will, I'm sure, continue to be asked, is about how do we, can we attribute any change to the use of technology and, and to what extent? So if we introduce or if a technology or if it infiltrates school, um, some changes take place. Can we say they are attributable to the technology or to some other factors that are around uh, other changes that are taking place in society? Young people are different, perhaps. Lots of things are happening in the world today that affect education. So it's a tricky area uh, and uh, certainly lends itself to a lot more research to, uh, to uh, understand this, these changes. Um, mobile phones can be examined also in relation to other technologies. Um, they differ in many respects. Um, they are generally carried without a pre-designated purpose. So they're just technologies that we have in our pockets, in our, in our bags, um, and, and use them as and when, which um, differs from the, the purposeful use of technology in school. And nowadays, mobile phone use is so central, it can actually mean that participation in some social uh, practices becomes difficult without it. Um, Torbjörn also has compared tablets with um, mobile phones. Um, there seems to be a convergence between the two. They used to be thought of as different kinds of devices, but increasingly they're, they're quite similar. However, the context in which they are used um, tends to still be, still be, still, there are some differences. Then there's the issue of bring your own device to school, and um, this is uh, something that's been addressed in mobile learning research as a, as a field of research. The user um, or the learner being able to choose their own technology is uh, something that's currently being emphasized in a learner-centered approach to education. <coughs> so, uh, but of course there are some quality issues, uh, equality issues rather, quality issues maybe perhaps as well. <laughs> um, access to technology might be a, a question, even though everybody has technology, they don't, they don't all have the latest smartphone, for example, um, and they don't all have a phone, or they don't all own it. Um, and this is something that's very current in mobile learning research. <coughs> so we also need to think about mobile learning as a research field and how mobile learning has been defined. So you looked at 
definitions and the most accepted one nowadays is learning across multiple contexts through social and content interactions using personal e electronic devices. It's this context crossing that's important uh, and emphasis is emphasized. So not just thinking about learning in school or at home, but how these contexts are being crossed <coughs> traverse um, <coughs> boundaries between them. And we can think here about whether mobile learning is conceived like that, it is understood in that way by uh, generally, you know, about do policymakers think of it in that way? That it's <coughs> that these technologies enable people to cross contexts and to have social and content interaction. Um, do they think of it of mobile learning simply as an extension of e-learning? And um, we know that mobile phones can have both beneficial and harmful aspects, and this is something that Chandran has um, has emphasised. They can be misused. Uh, they can be used for cheating, um, cyberbullying, and so on. So we know that there are issues, and these people and uh, students, teachers, all recognise this. It's how how these things are dealt with that's that's important. So um, in terms of Swedish policy, um, th there's an account in the thesis of how things have developed. Uh, but a crucial point in time was the introduction of a law in 2007, giving teachers the authority to confiscate objects they deem to be disturbing or dangerous, and that would include potentially mobile phones. Um, and uh, schools then can have local policies banning mobile phones. Um, and as I understand it, they may or may not have such uh, policies. Um, they may have, so I'm not sure to the extent to which they are, those such policies are written down or communicated, but that seems to be a, an area of ambiguity. Still, maybe even following your research, uh, it's still not entirely clear how, how things are. Um, interesting also to think about the national curriculum, uh, which uh, emphasizes pre preparing students for a changing world where technology plays an essential role, but with no specific mention of mobile phones in 2013. <laughs> uh, but more recent uh, revision of curricula. Um, are uh, emphasising the development of what's called digital competence and um, the acknowledgement, I think, that mobile phones and apps can be tools for schoolwork. So something is shifting uh, in the overall picture, there's more recognition that these things can play a role. So quite a bit of background there, but I think important to understand where this is all situated. And now we move um, to uh, talking more about the thesis itself, the work undertaken, how it was conceived, how it was framed. Uh, so we're, we're going to talk about this in terms of what we call theoretical framing. So theoretical framing being um, the use of theory, or different kinds of theories, different kinds of conceptualizations to help understand the phenomenon, to help understand it, perhaps to also, in some cases, help to predict how things will, uh, will pan out. So in this case, we're trying to understand uh, some tensions and different people's perspectives. So how can we do that? What are the theoretical framings that uh, are available that can be adopted um, to, to help with that? And um, there are a number of uh, theoretical approaches that, that are, have been adopted by uh, Torbjörn. Um, the thesis considers the renegotiations of the boundaries between social practices. So looking at social practices in school, outside school, in between the two. Um, there are some <coughs> boundaries that can be imagined, but also some um, some boundary spaces in between where uh, some negotiations have to take place around changing practices. Um, and these have been generated by this phenomenon of students bringing technologies into school. Um, 
So we also have the concept of mediation, that human activity is mediated by tools that have a social and a cultural history, and that includes technologies like mobile phones. They, they, have, certain, um, they have certain baggage with them that they bring with them in terms of their use, uh, their um, expectations around how things are used, social practices. Uh, and so um, we can look at um, we can look at the, the issues that the, that, the, that the thesis is trying to examine from different uh, perspectives. And in this particular thesis, um, Torbjörn decided that historical materialism was going to be helpful, and that was going to help understand <coughs> the emergence of the tensions. So, historical approach to you know, understanding the, the history of um, the, the evolution of the debate, the public debate around around the issues. Boundary crossing was going to be an important um, uh, concept to examine the, the tensions and crossing these boundaries. And the evolution of uh, what I mentioned at the beginning, the, the, the infrastructure for learning, to show how the infrastructure is evolving and where that's, where that's leading, showing the implications of these changes. So the thesis elaborates on uh, many concepts around um, mediation, mediating uh, um, mobile phones as, as mediational objects, um, and the conflicts and the tensions and the boundary crossing. So um, <coughs> important to consider mobile phones uh, as mediating interactions between humans and their environment, carrying historical and cultural values, they are boundary objects um, that kind of straddle the different worlds, the so social worlds, um, and conflicts arise around the use of these tools. And these conflicts can be attributed to a lack of common coherence between two or more stakeholders involved. So there are conflicts, there are um, tensions, but uh, these conflicts and the, the boundaries can also be seen in a positive light. They can be seen as resources for development. They're not just a negative thing. Um, the use of mobile phones brings external practices of the social world, out, brings in um, the social practices of the external world into school. And so this boundary, this is the boundary crossing. But something that's interesting um, in the thesis is that um, maybe some people have boundary crossing competences. They function well in, in uh, multiple contexts. And that's quite an intriguing notion, I think. Um, thinking maybe of the, of the students as, as people who have, or some of them perhaps, as having these special boundary crossing competences. Uh, and, and functioning well in, in, uh, in, in multiple contexts and maybe teaching others how to do that. Maybe this is a, an important um, 21st century uh, digital competency, uh, boundary crossing. Um, uh, and, uh, and what would that, um, what would that <coughs> entail? What, 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 is, what can be considered to be constituents of such a competence? Um, and also, as uh, already mentioned, infrastructure for learning is a, a key concept in the thesis, um, thought of as an ecology of material and social resources. This infrastructure grows and changes, it evolves. It's a slow process. Uh, the changes involve struggle and negotiation, and there may be breakdowns along the way. It's a complex infrastructure, relational and layered and can be difficult to identify and separate and study. So now we come to the actual uh, studies that were undertaken for the thesis, the, sort of the, the heart of the research. And uh, we can think about um, the research design and the methodology, and then I'll say something about each of the studies. So the um, research uh, adopted uh, uh, mixed methods, both qualitative and quantitative, from a pragmatic perspective. 
the um, public debate was studied through an examination of newspaper articles over a period of years. And this entailed some textual analysis, some content analysis, and some statistical analysis of um, these articles that have been pulled out from um, a database where they are archived. So they were selected out of that database and then, and then uh, they underwent an analysis to see what, can be learned, what could be learned from, from that debate. Um, so that's one aspect of the research. The other one is the examination of teacher and learner views, experiences, practices, it's all, all those kinds of things. And that was done by questionnaires and focus group interviews. Again, we can think about different ways that uh, are possible researching this kind of area. Um, questionnaires, interviews, group interviews are two available methods. So let's now look at the studies that were done. Um, the first one was, uh, so um, three of them I think have been published. And the third one is um, in preparation. So the first one uh, was published in 2014. So this is the study that uh, looks at the public debate as reflected in Swedish print media in the time period 1996 to 2013, mobile phones in school settings. And um, Torbjörn has adopted a historical materialist approach to analysing this debate. Two newspapers were examined, and I understand these are um, newspapers with the largest circulation, um, or were at the time, I don't know if that's still the case, but uh, uh, certainly <coughs> as I understand in terms of print media, these were are uh, newspapers with the largest circulation uh, and they are described as being part of the superstructure of uh, legal, political and other institutions that exercise control over the forces of production and uh, schools um, with their staff and students are seen as uh, producing <coughs> the learning. The um, Newspaper articles are, in a sense, remnants of the debate. That's a nice expression uh, in, in the thesis, remnants, because they're kind of fragments. They're, they're what's left from the debate that we still, that's still around, that we can look at, but it's not the whole picture. It's some kind of remnant. And um, we've shown a chronological analysis of what was represented in the press, um, in relation to political events as they unfolded over that time period. Something that's remarked on uh, in one of the findings of this study is that the debate appears not to have been built on scientific principles, even though those were being um, promoted uh, in that time period as being uh, important for education. Um, but. Um, the debate was uh, based on, was represented in the press as, um, as uh, being the expression of politicians' views, um, with um, lack of lack of evidence as to where, what, what those views were, were exactly based on. Um, certainly, um, research studies don't appear to have been quoted as backing up uh, those views. Uh, so um, there's a question about the scientific basis um, behind the, the debate, or whether the, there, there was such a, such, a, such a scientific basis, whether the debate was being driven by political interest. And various views are expressed. Some students, some teachers were included in those, in those articles in the press. 
um, so there were various dissenting voices, but uh, not no kind of overall balanced uh, representation. I suppose is, is quite being made. Um, uh, but this whole study uh, leads to some reconsideration or, or rethinking of or thinking around conceptions and cultures of learning. You know, the traditional classroom, how how um, how that should be organised, what that's like, um, what homework is like, or schoolwork that takes place at home. And um, and the and the political struggle to, el to eliminate uh, phones from class is represented in, in, this, in this study. So that was uh, completed in 2013 and then published. Um, so so that's one aspect of the research. And then um, then what else? Do we have? We've got two studies that um, concern students' perceptions and views. So, uh, one of these student based studies was published in 2014. Um, so, uh, this study was looking at mobile phones for schoolwork at home and at school. It was a small study based on a questionnaire distributed to one class. Uh, this is quite common in, um, in doctoral research to undertake a small study first to try out a few things, explore some ideas. Um, also gives you the opportunity to look at things in depth. Uh, so there can be different reasons for, for doing a, a small scale study. Sometimes a matter of convenience, of course. Um, and, but this study actually was part of a larger evaluation of a one-to-one, -one, um, so one, uh, one device per student initiative. And it, uh, as I understand it, it drew on another survey of teachers that was done within that larger evaluation. So uh, sort of this kind of comparison of data between the student views and some findings from this other survey. The uh, findings overall uh, were that students brought homes to school, brought phones um, to school every day. Most used them for schoolwork at home. And this interesting detail about the kind of uh, <coughs> work that they use their, pho their phones for. Often it's <coughs> collaboration with their classmates. Also some translation, which intrigued me. And many find it suitable for school. Um, but they identify some obstacles. And they believe that computers, so I suppose laptops or desktop PCs, are still best for more traditional school tasks. So maybe writing essays or taking notes. And the concepts of boundary objects and boundary crossing are used to understand the students' experiences in this study. Given that the same object, so the mobile phone, may have different meanings in different social worlds. So that was the first um, study with students. As I said, based on a questionnaire, quite small scale, um, but identifying some of the detail of their of their practices as reported by the students. So um, it might in some cases be possible to observe students, how they use technologies, but in this case they were asked to do it, right? asked to comment on how they use their use their phones. Um, and it gives an insight into what happens at home because it's something we don't see. So we need to ask people what happens there. It's not easy to follow them into their homes and observe them. Another study was done uh, in this thesis, um, also with students. And here it was a larger survey. So 206 
respondents participated. Intriguingly, the response rate was 100%. I don't know how you achieved that. <laughs> it's very good. And um, there were four group interviews uh, in across two schools. So the study took place across two schools. Um, so out of that larger group, for the interviews, they were given a it was a kind of stimulated response, so they were given um, <coughs> something to read, which was a debate, a, a debate um, from a newspaper, and it was, in a sense, looking at their reaction to the debate, or at least the debate was, you know, with, within the, the scope of, the, of this research. So it was not just their practices, but their reaction to the debate. Um, there are interesting findings from this study, uh, again about the different uses that the students highlight. Um, cooperation with other, uh, with other um, students, translation of popular activities, also internet use and um, looking at pictures using sound and, and, and other activities, but these are kind of the ones that they tend to to highlight. Uh, students' mobile phones are part of their infrastructure for learning. So, yeah, the, it's, it's a separate infrastructure from the, student, from the school's infrastructure, but it becomes part of it. it there's, a, there's that bigger picture, how the two come together. And the question, there are questions that arise around how all this is managed and negotiated. These technologies, uh, even the students acknowledge that they are distracting, in many cases, disturbing. And some of them seem to know how to manage that, or see that it could be managed, could be negotiated. Um, and then there are some that are quite negative, so there's a, there's a range of views. Uh, there's an emphasis on personal responsibility for use. Each person should understand how to use the technology, take responsibility for its use. And it's suggested um, by you that, uh, uh, some, uh, well, by someone else that you quote, that um, a social contract uh, is needed, um, or you know, might be the way forward in terms of a negotiated approach to how mobile phones might be used responsibly in and out of class. So um, just before I go on to the final study, a little picture here that I think again that's one that I'm introducing rather than it being from a thesis. But uh, just maybe the, the, all of this work made me reflect on what it means to learn at home. What kind of images are conjured up in our minds when we think of students learning at home? And um, I don't know what's in your heads when you hear it, but maybe you're thinking about someone sitting in their bedroom. Um, are they <coughs> with other? Uh, other students um, are there with their family, parents, um, siblings? Are they working individually, or are they connected to other people? Uh, I think there's a lot of questions that are raised by this kind of research about, you know, home learning that we know still know very little about, um, and if home learning is actually changing as well, um, because access to portable technologies means that home can be outside and it can be in a cafe and it can be in different places, uh, then the, the home learning is actually changing uh, in ways that we don't fully understand yet. Um, and I think it's, um, it seems to be important to consider in, in this kind of work. Um, especially since the findings from the student studies emphasize that connectivity between students, that cooperation that takes place when people are doing um, the 
the, uh, the homework. So now we come to the final study that was included in this thesis. It's a manuscript that's in preparation. And this time, the focus is on teachers, teachers' views and perspectives. So a survey, again, was done by an online questionnaire. Uh, teachers from four schools participated, 276 of them, from different discipline backgrounds. And um, the focus was the extent to which they feel they can or they actually do give permission to, uh, to use mobiles in class. 151 of them responded about actual permitted uses in class. And um, there were subject differences in their um, approach, views, actual uses. I think here um, I'm referring to the actual uses that they, that they uh, reported. And um, here they're, they're talking, for example, with the languages. Um, the teachers are talking about permission given with regard to using pedagogical apps. Uh, whereas the maths teachers might be talking about calculator apps being permissible or um, listening to music to help the students concentrate while they're doing maths problems. So kind of quite specific <coughs> uses relating to the subject area. So rather than thinking more generally about, are phones permissible? It's, are they permissible in the discipline? Are, they, are these particular uses permissible? And there's some analysis here about the relationships betwe between um, <coughs> their beliefs, the teachers' beliefs regarding ICT in general, with, uh, with regard, and then with regard to mobile phone use and social media use, so kind of mm -hmm. more novel technologies. Um, and, and that's explored a little bit uh, as to whether there are some relationships between these aspects. The social media could be accessed on, on laptops or PCs as well as on mobile phones. The conclusion being here from the study overall that um, the use of mobile phones in school is mainly unintentional, so not planned, not intended by the teachers, um, without much guidance or, or training for the teachers, at least the ones that were included in this study. Um, so it's a kind of adoption by stealth. That's uh, my expression here, but it's one that's uh, been used elsewhere in the literature. Adoption um, by stealth, meaning that uh, it's not overt, but it's it's happening, and, it, and it, is, it is there. Um, so those teachers that are those teachers that are permissive um, are happy about that happening. But then there are those who are more reluctant, um, and um, they might need more overt guidance, as I understand it, or more training. But if that's not provided, then those are the ones that are not currently permissive, may not move to or to be permissive. There's that kind of tension there. I think. So um, that actually brings me to the end of my summary of, uh, of this interesting work. Uh, and I hope it's given you a flavor of, um, of what's in the thesis, if you haven't previously read it. And uh, <coughs> hopefully given you a, a, a flavor also of some, some of the, the, um, the issues that it has raised and, uh, and questions that may follow from it um, and beyond the thesis. So I'm going to pause there. <laughs> the next thing. Thank you. Can I ask the candidate if he has any comments to the summary? Um, I, uh, it was really interesting to hear you summarize my thesis. And um, um, no, I don't really want to 
add something right, right now? I think it was uh, very thoroughly gone through. Yeah. Okay. It is now time for the critical discussion between the candidate and uh, the opponent. Please. Okay. Um, I have to prepare the two questions, but um, you can find them. Yeah. <laughs> um, in the meantime, why don't we just start by you just telling us uh, what motivated you to do this work? Just yeah. A little bit of the general per personal motivation. Yeah. Well, uh, I started working as a teacher in 2007. And uh, at the time, it was uh, much debate about what to do with uh, mobile phones in school. It was a heavily debated uh, political issue at the time. And uh, as I was working as a teacher, I did not experience those problems with mobile phones in the classroom. And uh, I think that at the school where I was working, this was not a big question really among uh, the colleagues either. So uh, I was a bit, uh, yeah, sort of uh, amazed or surprised by how this uh, question could have such uh, such an impact on the political debate. And uh, I thought about my own time when I was uh, going in school and. It was always uh, uh, difficult to get technology to do fun stuff in the education, like uh, filming or uh, recording a, like a radio program or something. That occasionally happened, even before mobile phones. But then it was always a lot of uh, problems with getting the technology, borrowing the technology, borrowing a camera, learning how the camera functions, and all of those aspects. But with the mobile phone, I, I, I saw that the students, they had this technology already and they could use it. And then a ban was suggested and argued for. And I was a bit, I thought, uh, why, really? I was, uh, was wondering why don't we think, try to do something with this technology instead? Because there is so much you can do. So I, I, I had a sort of positive approach from the beginning. Uh, but I think that over time I uh, realized that uh, this is not so much, I mean, when I started to think about this I thought that, oh, you just have to learn how to do this, learn how to master a function, sort of, and then it would uh, solve itself. But during my research I noticed that this is um, more profound social layers that I was not aware of uh, back then. Yeah. You developed uh, your, your views and yeah. your, 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 your take on uh, education would have changed over that time. Um, and certainly mobile learning prompts you to rethink educational practice, um, conceptions of the classroom. Um, because some because of much of the learning takes place outdoors or in students' homes and so on. Um, so I'd be interested to hear at the outset just how your views of the classroom may have shifted over that time. You know, were you sort of quite a, did you have quite a traditional view yeah. to begin with and has, has that changed? Has your research changed your your views? Um, well I think so, yeah, of course, it, it has, because I've been... In what, in what way? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, well, I've become aware more of all these, like, how connectivity <coughs> and, uh, and uh, the technology and mobile learning concepts can bring the outside world into the classroom. I think, uh, I mean, I think still that classroom is... Uh, central in, in schools and in schooling to me because uh, <coughs> I don't think it's so easy to change uh, that part of school organi organization because it's it's how we understand school, it's how we 
we organize school traditionally and it functions quite well, but still uh, the classroom is not as sealed off anymore as it used to be. Like when we close the door uh, before uh, we had internet or and connected technology, what happened outside our classroom most of the time stayed outside our classroom. But now, when we close the door, we just close the door. What's outside our classroom still still enters the classroom with this technology. So uh, I think that we have to to manage that in education by recognizing the teachers need to develop their competence and uh, their content knowledge to be able to uh, address issues and questions that is not predefined by themselves but that uh, emerge from the students having contact with the world outside their classroom. And I think uh, through my research I I've uh, learned to understand that more thoroughly, I think. Okay, yeah, that's good. Um, so, you've been working in the field of mobile learning by doing this kind of research, although some would might argue that classroom-based mobile yeah. learning is, is not mobile learning. Yeah. It's something that you, you raise in your thesis. Um, so you have worked with the definitions that are in the published literature. What's your perspective on that now in terms of you know, how adequate are these definitions that you worked with, the, the idea of crossing contexts? Yeah. Is that something that teachers would relate to? So this is, it's a definition that really was, has been forged more in the, in the research. Yeah. Arena. Well, I, I think I saw a greater potential maybe in the beginning of my research for that context crossing really than what I think is uh, is really happening with uh, like working with different uh, the students could work with different subjects in a, in a classroom of math if there was time or so they could work with uh, history for example uh, sort of coming away from the, the context of the schedule and the, and the and sort of such. But I don't think that is happening that much, but there still is a potential for it. And uh, I am interested in, I think that <coughs> I'm interested in, in like the schools. I'm not a radical mobile learning researcher uh, researching uh, mobile uh, very experimental or, or ap like mobile applications or so on, but I, I want to stay in the former context. Mm -hmm. But I still think that mobility is, is what the mobile phones bring into the classroom. It can take the student out of the classroom uh, contextually, but still being in the classroom yeah. physically. Yeah, yeah. So access from the yeah. classroom to, to the outside world. So when you now think about context crossing or boundary crossing, how do you see it now? You know, what, what do you think? So based on the research, but also you know, looking to the future, but that's kind of thinking about the, this, this context crossing. What, what's your take on it now? What kinds of contexts can be crossed, should be crossed, are being crossed? Um, yeah. Well, from my, from what the students say yeah. in the in the focus group interviews, they there is an example of when the students are having a discussion, and uh, they kind of feel that they don't they can't go any further in the discussion, and then they go online and see what's online, and then they get some new input and they can they they say that oh we can, uh, it was like that, and then the, their discussion can move, move on. 
So they cross out to the outside of the classroom uh, to some uh, knowledge, source of knowledge outside, or source of information outside the classroom, and then take it in and can move on uh, in their discussion. And it was an example that the students yeah. mentioned themselves. That's right. I remember that example. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> so overall, you've been looking at. Um, at barriers, conflicts, you know, tensions, and so on. Um, so, what, what would you say again, sort of now, you know, from the perspective of someone who's, who's finished this 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 work, this research? Um, what would you say are the greatest barriers to integration of mobiles? And then maybe also how might they be overcome? So, overall, from the research, the different studies that you've done, students' perspectives, teachers' perspectives. What are the greatest barriers to integration of this of mobile phones into classroom? Well, I think it's the understanding of of uh, a mobile phone and the understanding of what students do with their mobile phones. I think that is the greatest barrier. If mobile phones would be recognized more as uh, as uh, not uh, as something that is foremost a disturbing object, but rather something that you could carry out a lot of different things or uh, functions with and activities with activities that also benefits learning. If that shift can happen, then I, I think that is the greatest barrier, the understanding of what a mobile phone is. But, and I think it's, we see it in the, like when, in the study with the teachers, when we ask them about whether they permit mobile phones, uh, they uh, state uh, rather low, those teachers who say that they uh, permit mobile phones in the classroom, they still s state that it's uh, to a rather low extent. But then when we unpack what they, uh, the, the different users, then some of the users are permitted to, to quite some higher extent. Mm -hmm. So when, we, when the mobile phone is understood as uh, the mobile phone, the, the, the object of mobile phone, but when considering the uses that the mobile phone can mediate, then, uh, then it's, uh, it's, a, it's a different thing, a different uh, understanding of, of what it is. Yeah. And that is the barrier, I think, to overcome that. Looking at uh, talking about, we have to talking about banning mobile phones should be talking about how to get students not to use the mobile phones for disruptive or disturbing activities. Right. Yeah. So that's reframing. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah. So. So what, what, what would help to overcome this? So you say it's a question of understanding. Um, so are you proposing that, that you know, it's possible to change people's understanding? And if so, how, how might that be done? How do you change understanding? Well, I think... Uh, Having a discussion about it, of course, and like, like you, you said, I quote uh, those who write about uh, having some kind of social contract about uh, how how to use a mobile phone and what to do with it. I think it's um, having a discussion with that involves teachers, students, and uh, and uh, parents and other other stakeholders uh, is what needs to be done. And I think that maybe my thesis can be part of informing such a, such a discussion. Okay, so an uh, informed discussion. Yes. Yeah. Um, informed in what way then? What, what, would be, what would need to be part of that discussion? So it would be productive and actually change um, attitudes, views, <laughs> practices. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very difficult. <laughs> to say, of course. Oh well, yeah, but just what you what, what yeah. you imagine, or how you how you might go about it, I suppose, in, in some future role. 
Yeah, if you I think. Have uh, that influence. Yeah, I think that uh, yeah, teachers, of course, become becomes very important uh, to probably be being able to s when something happens in class to take that discussion with the students at the time uh, and uh, include it into to a dis discussion about what school is about, um, the purpose of being in school, for example, and uh, um, yeah, and uh, trying to uh, get more. I, I imagine one way would be to get uh, more uh, use, uh, like more decided use of the mobile phones, more predicted use of the mobile phone to to make it more of a tool in school yeah. uh, by by intention. Would uh, would sort of like push away the bad bad behavior, the, the the unwanted behavior and the unwanted activities with mobile phone, and then uh, probably we have to, we have to accept that uh, we as a teacher teachers won't have their students' attention a hundred percent of the time always, and that has never been the case. There has always been uh, disturbances in the classroom, and the mobile phone is just. Uh, a recent, uh, th the new way of like sending notes to each other or, or challenging the teacher or yeah, it's it's a long tradition of yes. of lewd behavior in the classroom. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. So, I think uh, we have to understand that at the moment there has been distractions in the classroom before mobile phones, and there will be also. Later. So some of the ones that you, you list um, are um, quite interesting. Caps. Why caps? And there has been a. <laughs> there has been a, a quite a discussion in Swedish schools oh really? whether uh, students should be allowed to wear caps or not. Right. Why? Yes. Uh, some teachers, uh, I think, believe that. Uh, it's, it's disrespectful to them and to the school and to the setting to wear a cap in the classroom. Right. But I think that to some extent the discussion about mobile phones in school has sort of pushed the cap debate <laughs> to the side. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I haven't researched the debate on caps, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh -huh. I think that if you any teacher in Sweden or anyone who works with schools in Sweden know about the cap debate, okay. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we don't have school uniforms in Sweden, no. so yeah. so they can wear whatever they like. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in, in my presentation I touched on various concepts that you uh, included and, and elaborated on and so on, and infrastructure for learning was one of them, and I just wondered if you could say more about this concept, um, how you understand it now, um, and, and where it's heading, yeah. because it's a concept you took from other people's work, and yeah. you, you worked with it, so where have you an ended up, and how did you use it, and how, where have you ended up now? Yeah. Well, uh, as you said in your summary, I consider school as a social practice relying on a, uh, an infrastructure of social and material resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I think that uh, as there is uh, activities, is, uh, human activity as I consider it from this social social cultural perspective which the infrastructural perspective connects to uh, there in such a perspective human activity is mediated by uh, artifacts and uh, tools and so on and uh, in school there is a uh, certain 
there are some specific tools and arrangements that is uh, assigned to, to support the learning activity in the classroom. And uh, the classroom itself is part of this infrastructure. And uh, as I was looking at, uh, at the debate around mobile phones and the issue of mobile phones in the classroom, and uh, yeah, pretty much I, I, rec I saw this pretty much already when I was working as a teacher, but I didn't, did not know of it in, in terms of infrastructure. But I realized that something that is happening outside of the classroom is having a great impact on what is happening inside of the classroom. And um, for, example, for example, the political debate. Okay. That did not have... Uh, uh, the people in that debate did not have... Uh, they were not in my classroom. Yeah. And that debate did not really connect to the issues I had in my... the problems or the, the questions that was... Um, things, the activities that was going on in my classroom. So there was some... but still this debate had impact on what we were doing in, in the school. So... but I did not know of this as uh, infrastructure. I, I did not know the concept at the time. But I still could see that there is something that's happening outside of school that has impact on what's inside school. And then when I... Uh, started to uh, do research and became more further and further in my uh, doctoral studies, I came across this uh, concept of infrastructure. And it fitted very well to, it described very well this thing, this, uh, these resources and social and material resources that I had a sense of, but did not really know how to conceptualize in that way. And, um, and um, so I started to think about uh, what parts of infrastructure is accepted in school, what is school infrastructure consisted of, and what is it not consisted of, and what is accepted in, in school and what is not accepted to use as tools for learning in school. And uh, then I realized that there is, a, uh, there is an infrastructure outside of the... I, I, as I read about it, that there is a lot of infrastructure that enables the social practices outside of school, but then that there is a specific infrastructure that enables the social practice in, in a specific social practice, like school, for example, that is only accessible by those who are active in that social practice. And I saw that these two infrastructures are not, uh, not the same. They, there are conflicts between these two, and uh, the mobile phone was uh, one such area of conflicts, and the mobile phone that was so accepted in the infrastructure outside of school, the universal service infrastructure, as it's called, uh, create a lot of tensions in the infrastructure for learning in school. Um, yeah, so, and I think that the notion of infrastructure really, in my thesis, it, it provides an explanation that really makes these tensions around mobile phones uh, sort of explainable in a way. turn to the particular studies that you carried out. Um, they were very interesting and I um, wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the, um, you know, why you undertook each one and kind of the, the methodology that, that you employed, just to find out more about some of the detail as well, because you can only put so much in a, in a published article. Yeah. Sometimes you wanted to know a bit more. Um, but in terms of the first one, which was the one that you ex where you examined the newspapers, yeah. I was wondering about why you chose print media um, in the first place, uh, and, and whether you, when you were thinking about the whole challenge of examining the debate, whether you considered other sources, other ways of researching this. So basically, looking at published articles in the press is one, one approach to 
researching and public debate. Mm. So, um, on the one hand, you could have looked at other uh, printed documentation, um, other um, media sources, maybe online media. Um, you could have interviewed politicians. Uh, you could have done various things to yeah. sort of find out about about the debate. Um, and you specifically looked at, you know, the newspaper articles, which is fine. But I just wondered, um, a, why you went in that direction, and b, um, you know, what are the perhaps the limitations of such an approach because it gives you some things, but not not necessarily everything that you might want. Mm. So, um, could you talk to us a little bit about those two aspects? Why why you decided to do it that way and uh, the limitations? Yeah. Um, well, I uh, I have a uh, studied history. I have a master's degree in history, mm. and uh, within history, it's uh, quite common to do uh, studies of newspapers. They are uh, often used in sources of uh, for research within. History, so it was quite natural for me to, to start off with with those sources, and um, uh, why newspapers are uh, often used sources is because they uh, reflect uh, sort of the the common opinions in the society. It does they does not reflect really what they are not really reliable t to. Um, to, to describe uh, an event, for example, uh, because uh, because they are uh, they have a bias, sort of, and they um, they only give like a moment, uh, a brief moment uh, view of something. But if you want to know like about opinions in society at a certain time, then they are very uh, useful. To to get uh, to that, and specifically, uh, there, there is the use of them as remnants. As you said, they are remnants of the debate. So, if you want to study the debate, <coughs> then they are they are remnants of the debate. They are the debate. So, as remnants of the debate, they are very reliant uh, about what was said in the debate, not necessarily whether the debate. If those people who are writing the articles are correct about what they are saying, but still they 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 provide their expressions and their opinions at the, the time when it happens. So uh, that is uh, uh, the reason why I choose uh, newspaper articles, uh, and also because uh, politicians and other stakeholders often use newspapers to communicate their messages. And uh, those newspapers that I chose was, uh, uh, one was a, an affiliated liberal and one was a, an affiliated social democratic newspaper. So I wanted to get, I did not want to have a political, uh, a single-sided political bias in the material. So I chose one from each side. Yeah. Um, and it turned out that mm, pretty much everyone was against mobile phones, whether they were liberal or social democratic. So, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, and why not other sources? Yeah, because uh, it was quite easy to get access to these newspapers, and they are uh, reliable for to to provide the data I needed for the purpose that I needed more than probably if I would have interviewed. Uh, stakeholders, they would have been uh, very biased. It would have been almost impossible to get a, an, uh, an unbiased view about of this from <coughs> from them of what they would have said at a certain time, for example, for the time period that I examined. Like in 1996, when the first article appears, there are no social media, uh, at least not in the same way as it is now. As we know it now, no. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's kind of in the newspapers represent. It's sort of 
it's the debate, but it's as represented by the, the reporters. Yeah, um, and by the stakeholders, because they write opinion pieces of opinion yes. also in the yeah. material. People being instructed to write about something. Pardon? People being, uh, the reporters, so the, the journalists. Yeah, the journalists maybe. Being, um, well, I don't know about that, but I mean, there are uh, politicians yeah. who have their like opinion pieces also yeah. in, in uh -huh. this material. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. So, yes, that's, that's true. Because so they're used in newspapers to communicate. Kind of yeah. So, um, I wanted to know more about the analysis as well uh, of, those, uh, of those articles. So, um, there would be, on the one hand, different kinds of articles uh, in those, um, like, as you say, there might be a column from someone has yeah. where they actually um, express their, their views regularly or. Um, there might be letters to the editor, so the different kinds of yeah. um, uh, articles that are published. Um, and, um, uh, and then you undertook different kinds of analysis of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the material. So um, did you make a distinction between different kinds of articles um, on one hand, and on the other hand, how did you actually conduct the analysis? I'd be interested to know more about the, the detail of the, the analysis itself. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have to go back in time now. Yes, <laughs> it is a, going back in time a little bit, but... Um, yeah, well, it was... Uh, about it? Yeah, it was two... It was both the, uh, the chronological and statistical yeah. analysis where I just placed them on a chronological yes, that one time that axis. Was more, um, Apparent in the actual yeah. uh, article that you were um, making a commentary on uh, on particular um, particular events and how those yeah. were reflected in, in articles in the press. Um, but when you talk about textual yeah. analysis or content analysis, uh, you know what role did that involve? Uh, it involved me uh, reading them, the articles, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, taking notes. Uh, and counting also uh, the like articles pro mobile phones, which were very few, and articles against mobile phones. And I was also counting, for example, a uh, number of articles in which different stakeholders appeared, uh, and, uh, and what they, and then I like took out specific, uh, specifically interesting examples or specifically significant mm -hmm. uh, examples of the debate. Right. So you didn't re really look at particular, uh, particular article types? Or like no, I, I took no. everything that was, uh, yeah. that was in there. But I did, uh, did, I did, a pre I did a, another uh, study before the study that is presented in here, which was uh, much broader, right. uh, which had uh, a lot of articles included. But but they had been uh, added to that in, in another database. They yeah. had been added to that database at different times, yeah. so I could not get a coherent data set where, uh, where I could have the same articles to, to, to compare over, over time. Some disappear and some start later and so on, but they, they uh, provided the, the, sec the study in, this, in the thesis provided a uh, similar uh, result as the as the tentative, uh, the pre-study sort of. Yeah. The result was the same, but I yes. could not use the data from the first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand that. Yeah, and um, so you were doing some kind of categorization of what you were reading. Yeah. Manually. Yeah, mm -hmm. and taking notes and uh, uh, yeah, I used post-it notes, I think. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I yeah took notes and uh, yeah. mm -hmm. and so on. Categorized. Uh, okay, yeah. So is, is that documented somewhere? Yeah, I have a I have a pile of paper down in my office. Okay. But uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Um, so, so, so yes, I think you explained very well, you know, in a sense, um, it was your, your background that kind of informed your, your preference for this way of uh, uh, 
going about the research and, uh, and the access to the, the, the articles made it, made it, made it easier. Uh, and, the, and the ability to trace historically what had, uh, what had uh, happened. Uh, I wanted also to examine um, your reasons for using the, um, the survey approach and the, the group, group interviews. Yeah. So, um, as we know, there are pros and cons, so advantages yeah. and disadvantages of using um, questionnaires. Yeah. We talk about those first um, to find out, you know, how people are, what people's views are, and what their practices are. Um, what's your experience of that in terms of what you've been able to discover or not discover by questionnaires? Yeah, I think that going over the, the data after having collected uh, data with a questionnaire, you often at least me, I did, I uh, wonder why didn't I ask some more questions, I, I really should have needed to know this as well. So uh, that is, I think, uh, it's, di it's a bit difficult because the analysis, when doing the analysis later, I, I need to, I find out things that I need to know more about yes. than I wish I have asked for. So, but then I guess. Is there anything like that that you remember wishing you had or <laughs> information you, you wish you had when you were doing the analysis? Yeah, I, um, I remember in, uh, in uh, the second article, the conference paper, I, I remember that we, we when we were, do, we were doing the analysis, we thought that why didn't we ask the students what they were using the mobile phones for? in school, not just what they were uh, no, see, believing that they could use the mobile phones for in school. Okay. And that was a bit frustrating. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, it's quite typical, isn't it? You want to keep the questionnaire quite short yeah. as well. <laughs> and yet you want to know more. Yeah. Yeah, so. um, did you think about other methods and discount them? Um, yeah. Of course, and uh, but uh, we chose those methods. I have chosen those methods, yeah. and I, I chose them because of uh, um, because I think that they provide uh, still they provide valuable data for uh, for getting getting to know about more how the mobile phones are is mm -hmm. perceived. Yeah. I mean, it could have. Uh, I could have done a, an ethnographic observation, for example, but but I'm not sure that that would have uh, uh, of course it would have been valuable to see what the students do with mobile phones in the classroom as well. But uh, <coughs> I still think that we got the reasoning and about how they perceive mobile phones from the surveys and from the focus group interviews. Yeah, yeah. And you managed to get a hundred percent response rate. Yeah. Like I mentioned earlier, that was how, how did how how was that arranged? How did that happen? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I uh, I, I was in contact with I was in contact with the schools, and I went to to the schools with the teachers that I had. Yeah. Uh, they agreed on letting me yeah. into the classrooms and serving the students, and I. They said that uh, now we do the survey. It was part of the class. Yeah, yeah. go online, yeah. do the survey, uh -huh. and uh, of course I, I informed them that you don't have to do this if you yeah. if you do, if you don't want to. But but I think everyone did. Yeah. Yeah, because we got just the same number of of uh, surveys as as there was so students. So the teachers who oversaw this. Yeah, the teacher and me. And you. Yeah, we were in the front of the classroom and they were sitting there for like five minutes taking the survey. So, and I introduced myself and I introduced to what presented what uh, data would be used for and so on. Yeah, it can be get hard to get people to complete surveys for sure. Yeah. So uh, it's good to get a high response rate. Um, and. Um, 
Yeah, you didn't actually sort of like interview the teachers or head teachers. So no. Is that something you thought about as well? Uh, yeah, uh, at least I thought about. Uh, I mean, I had the data from the teachers, so I didn't did not within this time frame really have yeah. had time to interview teachers. Uh, but I think that head teachers is uh, more of a perspective that need to be brought into the picture, uh, also because uh, we know that head teachers are very important for what is uh, going on in schools. So I would probably bring head teachers in the next time. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and you did some analysis of sort of the yeah, discipline-oriented um, differences, which was quite interesting. I think it, it makes among teachers. Um, yes, no. it was the teachers, right? Uh, yeah. Practices according to the to the discipline. Um, which was, I think, particularly valuable um, contribute in terms of the contribution. Now, but coming back to the students, um, so there were two studies and, and produced some interesting results. And I think you found that the students held very different views. Yeah. And um, they didn't all agree with, with one another. Um, no. Uh, and some, you know, were, were against mobile phones. Um, did you get any sense of you know what differentiated these students? Were they from different disciplines, or was it you know what was it particular experiences that had informed their their um, their their views, um, I or could you not get that from the, the data? Just well, I think it was sort of related to their own ability to manage the mobile phone in the classroom and not to. They were quite aware of how the mobile phone affected them and what impact it had on their studies. And I think that those students that had more difficulties with uh, and realized that they, it was difficult for them to, to manage to not to do uh, disturbing things with the mobile phones, they were uh, a little bit more uh, critical to the use of mobile phones in school as well. Mm. And, uh, okay. yeah. and that, that I think that is one reflection. <coughs> mm. um, yeah. Did your focus groups include students that were kind of known to be distracting others? No, we did not uh, select uh, yeah. anyone on that sort of basis. No. No. How did you select them for the focus groups? We had the survey yeah. before, and uh, we tried to get uh, three different kind of focus groups, focus students that were more uh, more negatively approaching mobile phones in school, and one that was more positively, and then a sick, uh, yeah, and then a group with uh, that was mixed. But then it turned out that uh, it was not that easy to to get these students in this sort of groups yeah. to to the focus groups. Yeah. Uh, because as uh, happened, it was a blizzard here in Gothenburg. Yeah. The weather appeared. <laughs> and, and on the day that uh, we had uh, planned to do focus groups, the students couldn't come to school. So we had to like take those that still was there. Yes. And it was over there. And interview them. Mm. And uh, then it also was a problem, I think, with, uh, to some extent, with that the teachers at one of the schools uh, did not think that it was a good idea for some students to leave the lessons to, to come to the focus group. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> These are kind of quite typical constraints yeah. that you work on. But I think that we got yeah. quite a good data set anyway. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, and um, so, as I mentioned earlier, some of the students were using um, mobile phones for translating. Yeah. Um, do you know what that was about? What, is, what kind of translation they were doing and why? I think it must have been in, in language, like English or Spanish or so. 
because it, it occurred to me it could also be students um, who's, uh, who didn't have Swedish as a first language, yeah. that they could be using um, the mobile phone as, you know, to support their learning yeah. um, in, in that sense. So not necessarily for like for, you know, in a in mm. language class, mm. but for other purposes as well. So um, it, it's just something that just translation doesn't sort of get under the surface of yeah, but I don't think that I don't think that the Swedish language was that much of a problem to any of the students in uh -huh. this foc these focus groups. In these particular focus yeah. groups, yeah, right. So, um, and, and how do you know that? Um, yeah, that's a, a good question, of course. But um, we we didn't notice anything, any such thing during during the interviews or uh, when uh, transcribing the, the data or so on. They, there was some, uh, maybe a few with uh, uh, that came from uh, another country, like the second generation immigrants or something, but there were no, no newly arrived or anything in these uh -huh. classes. So yeah. So you think you could have, you would have spotted it in the in the focus groups? I, um, but I in think the, so. In the um, survey, there was no specific question about that, about their background. Like no, the there was no, like no. Yeah. Um, it could have been interesting to add. Yeah, it could have been something. Yeah. To include. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, they talked about how they communicated with other students um, a lot, and I suppose. We think, well, they communicate outside of class, so maybe they should also communicate inside of class, but we don't know so much about the communication, what kind of uh, communication takes place, mm. uh, whether, whether communication that takes place you know, outside of class would be the same kind of communication, would be appropriate in class, mm. call it all communication or co coordination of activity, but... Um, I guess the survey doesn't give us, or even a group focus group doesn't give us a lot of detail about. No. Oh. But uh, yeah, they mentioned that they organize themselves in Facebook groups. Yes. Uh, dependent on subject or their class, so that they could communicate with each other there. And um, I mean, there is a lot of communication going on. That is one of the problems, also, that because they get notifications all the time. Yeah. Uh, so, and I guess it's very quite difficult also to say what is really schoolwork and what is not schoolwork in in such a regard. I mean, if you decide, uh, I think it would be interesting also to ask the students what they consider as schoolwork related to get uh, their view on on what they perceive as schoolwork, because we might perceive something as schoolwork that they don't perceive as schoolwork. So that would be uh, interesting to, to dig uh -huh. into more, I think. Yeah. Um, okay, so, um, so just on the subject of social media, this which we just touched on, Yeah. Um, I was intrigued by what you were trying to establish um, with regard to relationship between social media use in class. So some teachers were using social media uh, in their teaching, yeah, um, and mobile use. So, and it wasn't entirely clear to me in, in what was I think the final hmm. paper. Yeah. What that relationship was. So I wondered if you could clarify for me what you what your finding there was about the social media use in relation to you know their attitude or their use yeah. of social media. I think that and what we found was that even if most teachers do not use social media in their teaching in the education, there is still a little group of teachers that does. Yeah. Uh, and uh, compared to mobile phones, one might expect that even though most teachers do not intentionally use mobile phones or encourage it, uh, some do, but that was not the same. There was fewer teachers that were encouraging the use of mobile phones that were encouraging the use of social media. So mobile phones was 
mobile phone uh, is more uh, seldom used than social media. Okay, but do we know how they're using the social media? Are they using them on phones or? Uh, no. No, we, we don't know that. No. Yeah. So when when you, when you were asking about social media, you didn't ask about what technology was being used. For social no. Media. no. Yeah. Uh, so it could have been phones. Could have been phones. Yeah. Probably was. Uh -huh. I don't know. Yeah, probably <laughs> was. <laughs> probably was. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Um. So. You know, I suppose um, I have a few sort of final questions. But mm. Yeah, we've got how much time have we got? <laughs> Take the time you need. Yeah. Um, so a, f a few more things that I just wanted to ask you about. Um, so I saw again, yeah, well a I think discussion around that, and then yeah, I think that you sort of give an update in a sense on what. Yeah, well, I don't think there has been much. Uh, I mean. Uh, the National Board of Education is, uh, is uh, suggesting mobile phones as a tool in school a little bit uh, now, uh, which was not the case before. Yeah. But uh, and I think that uh, what is has been specifically uh, the, the main consequence of the law is that it has sent a signal that mobile phones should not be used in school. It, it, it's something else than school. School is one thing and mobile phone is something else. It should be kept out of school. And there's a signal, I think, uh, which has been uh, very important that this law sent. Uh, instead of uh, signaling that technology is changing, we have to be uh, updated uh, on technology and be, be aware in schools of what technology uh, where, where the society is heading uh, uh, in regards of the use of technology. And uh, the law sent a signal that rather said that this is something that should not be in the school. Whether teachers uh, then used the law or whether they did not uh, is another question, but the signal is still clear. I think the, sim the symbolical value of this law. And uh, and uh, yeah, so that is, I think, uh, is a, a, a problem with having this legislation. And, uh, but uh, I don't know, maybe it was, uh, maybe it was good for teachers to have uh, a law also to fall back on, to, to, to like get an extra authority from when they need, need to, when they feel that they need to to uh, uh, stop some behavior in the class, mm -hmm. but I think uh, that the symbolical value of the law has been uh, very deconstructive. Uh -huh. yeah. And um, so, so the the whole starting point for this research was the public debate around um, around the use of mobile phones. <coughs> And um, your remarks that the the public debate had not been informed by research, or mm. didn't have good scientific basis to it. So, um, do you think researchers can inform public debate more effectively nowadays? Um, and if so, do you see ways of doing that? If the research is more researchers, researchers. Yeah, are more visible in the public debate, how can they participate? Yeah, in how they can participate? Yeah, inform, um, inform public debate. Yeah, I think something's different now from years ago. Well, it's very difficult to say, really. But I think. I hope. At least <laughs> that we can, <laughs> and that they will. Uh, I mean, it's up to journalists, I think, to 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 ask us about 
what is going on. I think. Uh, Are there any journalists? <laughs> no. No. There isn't. But uh, yeah, but I think um, school has been very heavily debated in Swedish media over the uh, yeah m more uh, at the time in the time period that I, I studied, but it's still often uh, is uh, a topic of news, the news in Sweden, and still, but and sometimes researchers are there, and I don't know how, how really we can... Through it social media, maybe? Yeah, maybe. Um, well, just finally, I think, well, two things. What, one is, what additional research do you think um, would be important to do, uh, if any, um, following on from what you've done. So, you know, either yourself or other researchers who are going to sort of carry on res researching in this area. What do you think might be important yeah. aspects to research? Um, well, maybe starting with that, and I'll do it too often. Yeah, well, I think um, we mentioned head teachers. Yeah. I think it's uh, important to. To, to study head teachers uh -huh. and how their uh, how their policy on local level at schools uh, are uh, reflected in practice and how they uh, pick up on uh, what students uh, uh, use in the classroom. I think their yeah the head teacher perspective I think it would be very uh, very important to have. And um, yeah, also I think that it would be, since I did this study with the teachers, I think that it would be, if we are, when we are uh, revising this uh, manuscript in preparation in here, I think that we are discussing to, we discuss <coughs> to add some more data, some newer data uh, with the, the teachers, and then maybe we could uh, compare the previous data uh -huh. to the newer data and see yeah. if there is any changes yes. there. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So that is, I think, uh, important. Mm -hmm. yeah. And finally, recommendations for practice? Yeah. What would be your top recommendations in terms of changing practices? Yeah, I would. Uh, I would like to to recommend to have a a discussion with students, for teachers to have a discussion with students, and, and the discussion that is uh, departs from a constructive uh, sort of viewpoint. That is, uh, the idea is not uh, how to get used, how to get the students not to use the mobile phone, but how to get students to use the mobile phone in an appropriate uh, or in a beneficial way and how for for the how to get this the, the students to, to yeah to make use of the benefits of mobile phones in school. And for doing that the, the, that discussion uh, has not aim at uh, getting the mobile phones out of the classroom or into the pockets of the students, but but uh, sort of uh, not to stop use, but to encourage good use. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. And do you think teachers would be able to do that? I guess if if they believe in it, I guess so. If they if they can see that uh, it is. Uh, that there are beneficials, beneficial uses there, and that mobile phone use is not just uh, disturbing or uh, challenging their authority, or or using mobile phones is a sign of uninterest in the in the topic. I think for those teachers that can see beyond uh, the disturbances, it is absolutely a possibility. Is there anything else you'd like to say?
Um, really. <laughs> <laughs> I think I said so much. I mean, yeah. So, so thank you for uh, a very interesting discussion. Yeah. Um, it would be interesting to hear if the grading committee have any questions. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the next step. Isn't it? Yeah. Thanks very much for this very interesting discussion. And um, I suggest we take a few deep breaths before we unleash the great discussion. <laughs> Get a bit of oxygen into the system. Yeah. Um, so we have um, the next step in the procedure. Questions from each of the grading committee members. And uh, you can organize yourselves in the, in the manner you <laughs> find best. I can start for new ones. I want to start. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have one comment. Yep. And I have two questions. First, the comment. Uh, six months ago, I would have said that it would be having very boring to read a dissertation about mobile phones in school. But then, bad friends, uh, but not me, <laughs> Banner asked me. And since it was him asking me to be on this committee, I said yes. Now I've read this dissertation, and it was a very great pleasure to read it. I liked it a lot. It's well, well written and it's well thought. I'm glad. Thank you. Then to my first question. Yep. Um, I was a bit um, surprised about your use of, bound, uh, of the mobile phone as a boundary object between school and home. Because I have a feeling that a mobile phone is a sort of universal boundary object that um, is floating around and could be a, a boundary object of any kind yeah. of uh, social context. S and also that, that the school and the home is not that divided into separate spheres as you can get the impression that you say. Have you any comments on that? Uh. Yeah, I think uh, I used to, uh, I call it uh, social worlds, uh, social world of home and social world of school. And uh, there is uh, different uh, conventions and rules in these two social worlds. And uh, that is why I, I yeah, think I that think the... It works, it works, yeah. there's no problem with that, but I thought that it was a very narrow way to use uh, the mobile as, uh, boundary. Yeah, but of course it ties a lot of different social practices yeah. together, yeah. dependent on what social practices the student and the or the owner of the mobile <coughs> phone is is active oh. in. But I understand you yeah. talking about the rules. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, my second question. No, I have three questions. My <laughs> second question is, when the the um, students in your uh, focus groups. Uh, become teachers, which some of them might be. Yeah, hopefully. Will they? <laughs> yeah. Will they be? Um, will they use the phone in a different way, the mobile in a different way, or, or what, what? What does that mean? Next generation. Yeah, uh, it's a very interesting question because I think that, uh, I mean, our ideas about what school, what school is about, our ideas of school is uh, very much coming from our own experience at school. So uh, uh, maybe they will be a little bit more uh, positive towards mobile phones. In and school. they will have a lot more experience. Of yes, the yes, the maybe. Yeah. And ma but maybe they will also uh, be used to being told to put their phone away and they will practice the same thing on their on them their students and who knows maybe mobile phones won't be around them anymore when they become uh, teachers <laughs> who knows what technology uh, is there then we don't know and then i have a third question have you sent this book to Jan Björklund? <laughs> uh, no i haven't really <laughs> yeah <laughs> I have uh, lots of comments, lots of questions. I will try to be focused. Uh, which of hmm, let's see here. Uh, you, you talk about mobile phones in schools, like like that is the topic. But is it really the topic that you have researched? Is it just an example of something else? Because 
when I'm trying to remember my own school, uh, my uh, years in school, uh, there was a discussion regarding, regarding digital watches with calculators. Yeah. Some people could cheat. Yeah. Donkey Kongs that we were using, Walkman, camera phones later on, but perhaps a sweet example, Tamaguchi. So the school needed to accommodate the Tamaguchis so they wouldn't die. So you could stop the, 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 the teaching, go and feed your Tamaguchi and then return back to the knowledge work. Yeah. But how will you use the Tamaguchi in the education? You could probably integrate it in some sort of uh, idea of taking care of living things and yeah, and about yeah, of course, uh, not killing. Yeah, things uh, yeah, like there of course there could sort of be a, a yeah a lot of. It's up to you as a teacher to invent that. I'm just a parent, so yeah. I, I don't know. I'm just worried about all these things that our kids bring to school. Yeah. So. So, so from from your point of view. Um, I, I think the cell phone is a good example of the problem of technology that the kids bring to school. But what is common between these type of technologies that that, that provide such a friction and dis distraction and, and so on? So are there general features? Is the, the f or are mobile phones a truly unique object? Mm -hmm. Or is it just an example of previous objects? What's your I think it's both. Uh, as you say, it connects to a tra tradition of, uh, of disturbances and uh, and uh, difficulties. Enjoy. And yeah, enjoy, of course. I was, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, but I think uh, the mobile phone is more uh, mutable in than a Tamaguchi, for example, or a Donkey Kong game. You could uh, use the mobile phone. Uh, in more advanced ways, depending on what we mean with advanced, but uh, in the education than what you could do with those other, other uh, gadgets. Uh, and uh, what is specific about the mobile phone then is that it is so similar to other technology uh, that is uh, advanced and that uh, schools have equipped their students with, for example, tablets, but still mobile phones is uh, is not welcomed or accepted, or you still consider mobile phones as something else, even if we could reason that oh, it's the same thing. No, it isn't. It's something else, depending on how uh, they are uh, uh, seen socially. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, but uh, since you have this infrastructure perspective, yeah. Here, uh, which I, I think is a, a very good perspective. You are also aware that um, there are um, many or uh, numerous examples of how when we try to design these infrastructures, for example, using top-down perspective and push technology, yeah. uh, exciting things start to happen. So if you're going to meet politicians in the end, or, or um, head, head teachers and so on, uh, what type of, and I'm returning back to, what type of recommendations are you going to provide in a more concrete way? Because currently, you are the person to give advice. Yeah. And just saying, let's discuss it. <laughs> Sounds like an awful Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe yeah. that can be a bit more distinct. So can you elaborate a bit more Yeah, but I think from this infrastructure perspective, I mean, if we have uh, uh, lots of money invested in providing students with infrastructure, mm -hmm. and the uh, infrastructure, as I consider it, in this thesis is uh, manifested through use. And then there is uh, one device, the mobile phone, which is part of another infrastructure, but it's as infrastructure through, by through this infrastructure. Is it about embracing it, or embracing change, or embracing... Yeah, but it's not embracing, it's, it's not so simple, because it comes with all these other uh, activities and uses that we have been discussing. Mm. Uh, here today, because yeah. uh, making something infrastructure into infrastructure is is a struggle between social conventions and different approaches to the technology and different yeah mm -hmm. ways of, of considering it. Yeah. But 
talking about these conventions and practices, uh, my last question, you're talking about the social worlds of school and home. Yeah. But I see uh, actors who are trying to, to provide some sort of resistance to these mobile phones. In school, they are called teachers. At home, they're often called parents. Mm. So are there another social world that needs perhaps in the future to be explored in order to truly understand how conventions and practices from that social world, where perhaps you, you and I, we don't have access to that, mm. and how that is actually influencing both the school and home as a social world? Yeah, probably. I mean, the social world of friends, for example, Yeah. which probably overbridges uh, these two. Yeah. And which the parents, which is quite strong in the social world of home, is not really part of the social world of friends, for example. Yeah. So, yeah, that could be. So, you have some more work to do? Yeah, there's always more work. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much both for a good presentation, interesting uh, discussion. And I'm the final one, so uh, uh, before the questions from the audience. Uh, so I was thinking, could you give a, you know, one example or a couple of examples of findings that have surprised you? So things that you didn't expect to find during these yeah. years? Yeah. I, uh, I was a bit surprised that the students were that aware of difficulties and that they could reason that much and that nuanced about their use of mobile phones. I, I would have thought that they would have been more like, let's just use the mobile phones. Mm -hmm. But they were not. They were really nuanced. And they could see difficulties with the mobile phones in a way that I had not expected. So uh, yeah, I think that's the main surprise in the material. Uh, I, I would have expected the students to be more positive towards the use of mobile phones. Why do you think they weren't more positive? Um, I think they are, they are aware of what's happening in the classroom. They see uh, that, uh, that other students are struggling with uh, concentration and they uh, are aware themselves of their having difficulties with struggling with their concentration and they they are aware of that it's easier to write uh, an essay, for example, which or a school assignment on a computer, since school assignments is part of of school, and it's uh, easier to write them on a computer. And they, it's 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 their life. It's their it's their practice. Yeah. Uh, so what else did you do very well is that you give an overview on the mobile phones in schools and these different ideas on what could the benefits be and, and uh, what are the disturbances. And uh, uh, but to some extent, I feel that this and uh, in other research also, also these examples are quite short. So you say you know you can search or you can translate words or you can use the calculator. Yeah. And I, I was intrigued by this example that you talked about that came from your thesis also where they use, in a discussion, where the discussion nearly died, they could yeah. use search for more information yeah. like that. In, that's a very interesting example. But I also reflect in that sense that maybe it's not unique for mobile phones. They could have a tablet lying around, yeah. a laptop. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But do you have any... You know, and they do it on computers, of course, also. Yeah, also. also. But do you have any like, examples that you've you know, seen when you've been in school or heard or in interviews and like more powerful or maybe a more detailed example of, of uh, beneficial use of mobile phones in school? Yes. If you would what, like to share one, something you've seen? Um, well, I am... Um I mean, I mean, you mean outside of my... Yeah, it can be outside as well, yeah. Yeah. Because, um, I mean, we, we use them. When I teach, for example, uh, I, uh, I recommend... Uh, I have a, a bought uh, textbook for the students that they can access online, for example, 
on their phones or in the computer. So when they have forgot their computer or it's somewhere else, they can it's okay for them to use the mobile phone. And uh, to me, that is not a problem, but it's it's a way of getting school into the uh, mobile phone. And of course, they take like pictures of the and that's uh, the students also state in the in the data that they take pictures of the uh, whiteboard in the classroom where the teacher have uh, written during the lesson. So uh, it's, it's a few examples. Yes. Uh, and the f final question, maybe building on that. So if you would imagine in five or ten years, how would you hope that mobile phones would be used in schools? Yeah, um, I think that the also on your last question, I think that it might be uh, that we should not look for like the uh, the big revolutionary use of the tool, but just as it is, uh, I hope that it will be a, a tool that is used as any other tool in school. If the if there is a good use of the mobile phone, then it's perfectly fine. The students know how to use the mobile phone. The teacher know that uh, for to the teacher it's okay if the students use the mobile phone. And it's it's not about doing revolutionary stuff with the mobile phone. It's just having it as a resource in the infrastructure and being able to use it when it's suitable. Yeah. Okay, thank you. This is your follow-up question here. Yeah. Talking about the future, and I, I, don't, I don't think you've studied mobile phones, I think you have studied this continuous development of, of what happens when, when new technology is introduced into a school. Uh, a few years ago, the, the some sort of video goggles or 3D goggles were, were the, the Christmas gift of the year, I think. Yeah. Will, will those or similar technology become the new uh, cap dilemma in, uh, in Swedish schools? Okay. When I want to read, I will use my goggles. But then you can't see people's eyes. And apparently seeing someone's yeah. eyes is another debate that has been in, in Swedish schools regarding yeah. clothes and so on. I don't know, really. But if you speculate. Yeah, if I speculate, I can say that I haven't really seen uh, that much use of those uh, 3D goggles anywhere, actually. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> We have them in lab down here, <laughs> and I have a, a, a pair at home in a box. Mm -hmm. I never use them. Okay. I don't have any student. My students don't have them. We don't have them really at the school. Uh, it's I don't see. I don't see them. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, I now invite questions from the audience. Just wave your hand, and you can also ask questions in Swedish. Anita. Yes. In the first paper, you used the historical localist perspective on the debate, and I think it's interesting. My question is, what is the most surprising insight from using this specific perspective? Uh, I, I kind of wonder, wonder because you say in the abstract that the debate is very much about conflict between the rulers and the rule, rule mm. and that's kind of, I think, an insight yeah. that, that is kind of obvious. Yeah. But what, what are the more uh, material insights? I, I yeah, I think it was uh, it was interesting to see how this struggle just went on and on. It it, it did not really affect the the forces of production. Uh, the relations of production were changing and there was a lot of tensions and conflict, but still nothing was really changed. The debate was the same. It, it did not seem to affect uh, the base at all, the fun foundation. So that was interesting. Are you kind of uh, going to uh, continue using that perspective in the sense or kind of...? Yeah. I mean, as an historian, it's uh, it's always uh, one perspective that has to be uh, considered to maybe apply. Yeah, I think so. But I mean, 
it's also a, a perspective that has some political connotation that connotations that can be sensitive. So it's uh, it could be wise to to consider that also. Because I mean the issue of ownership, which which is also in interesting uh, in that perspective, is something that could be used to analyze those who sell. Yeah. The money. Yeah. And in that way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? In Swedish. Ah. Uh, jag blir glad att höra detta du säger och tänker Torbjörn. För, för min erfarenhet handlar skolan om kontroll. När man släpper eleverna genom ditt sätt att tänka utanför klassrummet så startar en kreativitet som tillför hela gruppen och det är inte bara läraren som makten. Jag tror jag på så att, men det tar tid. Tummen upp. Uh, I, I wonder, I also had this experience with mobile phones when I worked as a teacher, but uh, I didn't experience it as problems. Um, but I thought about the perspective that uh, a, a student's mobile phone is also very personal. Yeah. Uh, it has uh, nice shells, uh, nice pictures and it, it's not just a thing like a tablet that you can borrow from school for your schoolwork. Mm. It's very, very personal. And that might also impact on the tension if somebody wants to have it from you, take it away yeah. from you. A and I wonder if you have found anything about the discussion that maybe students need to have some guidance regarding the personal things that they could use and that they bring with a mobile phone to school and how they could use the mobile phone in a structured way uh, for schoolwork. Because I know we have problems uh, with teachers who have difficulties to use technology in their teaching, in, in their pedagogical way of thinking. Do you think that we need to help students as well to see the potentials and the, yeah. the, the possibilities, yes, how they could use mobile phones in the school work, yes, what I they think could so. do with it. Yes, I think so. And the students also say that maybe that the next generation of students might uh, benefit from having some kind of training in how to use the mobile phones in school. So the students identify that problems, those problems themselves. Yeah. Questions? Well, I have a question. Now that you have all this new, new knowledge uh, that you are coming back to teaching, how are you not just implementing it, but how are you discussing with your students? Yeah, I uh, had this discussion actually yesterday. Uh, when uh, the students was, uh, they were having their headphones on when I was talking at uh, at whiteboard and uh, <laughs> they were having music on in their headphones. It was not just the headphones, but they were also listening to music at the same time. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and uh, so then I had a discussion with them about uh, how to to to. <laughs> to be a student and how to success, succeed in school and that it is necessarily necessary to like create uh, an environment around yourself where you can learn and uh, I think that hearing what I as a teacher has to say is part of uh, creating that environment so if it is difficult for them to to not listening to music, then take the headphones off. If it is difficult for them not to, to looking at the notifications, then try to turn the notifications off or put the mobile phone in the pocket. Simple things like that, mm -hmm. to to just to, to make them more uh, engaged in in the education at the time, and then they can uh, use the mobile phone for good things like listening to music when they are doing a uh, an assignment. If they feel that that's benefiting them. Mm -hmm. So I tried to have a discussion with them regarding just how to be, how to succeed in school and in that discussion the mobile phone was uh, part. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think, uh, like connecting back with uh, the questions before, that your experience, you, you are now the expert in this area, and you're actually back in the field, so to speak, uh, and, and your experiences on, on, on uh, you can actually give advice on how to proceed with this discussion to um, well, find ways of implementing and using the authority in school. I hope so. So do we have any more questions? I was just thinking about, uh, you're addressing the upper secondary school here, yeah. uh, which implies some kind of maturity when it comes to students, you can reason some with them. Have you encountered any, any ideas from the teachers regarding the younger kids? The, the younger kids in school. I mean, this is obviously an issue also with younger kids from yeah. 10 to 12. And yeah. But it's more, I think, a bit more complicated to talk to them about these things that you mentioned. Yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, of course, it, it is most certainly different aspects and that has to be addressed on different stages of the educational system in the school. I mean, in secondary school or elementary school, I guess it would be, be have to be dealt with in another way or discussed in another way or, yeah. But maybe if uh, mobile phone, the use of mobile phones is addressed earlier, then maybe uh, it wouldn't be as difficult in the later stages. I don't know. But I hope so. The, and yeah. So, no more questions. <coughs> I will then formally close this session and uh, the grading committee will, will withdraw to discuss the decision and uh, you're welcome to wait together with the candidates downstairs on, on floor three, we're on floor four now. Um, and um, the, the conference will take 30 minutes, 60 minutes, something like that. Thank you everyone.